You are watching the press preview, a first look at what's on the front pages as they arrive. Coming up, we'll see what's making the headlines with columnist at the article, Ali Mirage, and journalist and author, Christina Patterson. There they are, ready and waiting to go. So let's see what's on some of those front pages for you now. Well, the Prime Minister gave his clearest signal so far today that the easing of restrictions due on June the 21st will be delayed. That's according to The Telegraph. The Express asks if we will ever be free of social distancing regulations. While The Observer focuses on the G7 summit and what it describes as Boris Johnson's extraordinary public spat with EU leaders over the Northern Ireland Protocol. Government ministers should be banned from lobbying for up to five years after leaving office in the wake of the Greensill scandal. That's in the Sunday Times. The star leads on the miracle of ex-Spurs midfielder Christian Eriksen's treatment after collapsing during the Denmark-Finland Euros fixture tonight, which is uh, virtually the same front page for the Sunday Mirror. And we're joined tonight by Ali Mirage and Christina Patterson. Good evening to you both. Um, we're going to start with that uh, Telegraph front page and uh, the, the headline there that there are fears that the restrictions could be in place until the spring. Certainly the Prime Minister speaking to our political editor, Beth Rigby, has hinted at that today. Christina. Well, I must say, even for someone who's uh, known for being pretty... Uh, realistic about these things that came as a bit of a shock um i think i think the delay is not much of a shock to anyone uh, clearly boris johnson was very keen to stick to to keep his word on this uh, but it was always meant to be dependent on data and the so-called delta variant has changed everything it's unbelievably infectious it seems to be 64 percent more transmissible than the kent variant which was considerably more transmissible than the original variant which means that each person could infect up to seven people which is very bad news because there are still a lot of unvaccinated people um, a lot of youngsters have not yet had their opportunity to have a first vaccine, let alone a second one. And unfortunately, people with just one vaccine are being hospitalised at the moment, and quite a lot of them are quite young. So he clearly felt he had no choice but to do this. Um, and, you know, it seems like the sensible thing to do. Obviously, it hasn't been confirmed. But if we really do have to have restrictions till spring, that is pretty depressing, I have to say. Ali, is it, is it the sensible thing to do? The predictions are that this is the announcement that he will make on Monday, not necessarily at this timescale, but it won't be June the 21st. Well, Julian, it might be the sensible thing to do, but I think the government needs to be clear about what metrics it's using to make these decisions. I mean, I, I thought that Nadine Zahawi had made it quite clear that there were a number of factors, the vaccination rate, the, new the number of new cases, the hospitalisation rate and then the death rate were meant to be driving this process. But, but also, also one, of the, one of the criteria were the, um, the new variants and that had to be taken yes, into consideration, right. which is at play in this instance. Indeed, and the new variants as well. But we don't know exactly, Julian, what metrics beyond those they're actually basing these decisions off. And therefore, you could have another variant coming down the track in a few weeks that hasn't even been seen yet. So how long is this going to go on? So I, I think we understand Look, we understand that the government needs to be careful. It made a lot of missteps early on in this uh, crisis. It has found the path to redemption through vaccination, which is all very positive and good. Um, and it doesn't want to jeopardize that. However, we also do need to get the economy back on track. We have uh, two trillion of public debt. We have 350 billion uh, of borrowing this year. And we can't indefinitely go on like this. So I think the Prime Minister is going to have a lot of pressure from certain elements of his backbenchers. We know the COVID recovery group has been on manoeuvres, Mark Harper and the gang, uh, Graham Brady, the chairman of the 1922 committee, Annie and Duncan Smith, the former leader of the Conservative Party, all being very strong. But how long can this actually go on for? Uh, it's important to get the economy back up and running. And speaking from a personal perspective, as a part-time house music DJ, uh, I would love to get back into nightclubs uh, when it's safe to do so as soon as possible. Ali, that's something I didn't know about you. 
There you go. <laughs> you learn something every day. Um, Christina, though, on that point, um, what, what do you think of the, the argument that really we have to start getting on with, with life? And even if new variants do appear, we have to be able to, to deal with them um, and we simply can't just shut down forever. Well, we can't shut down forever, that's true. And by the way, I am not uh, a DJ, though. <laughs> <laughs> that doesn't surprise me. <laughs> I must say, I do massively miss parties, you know, socialising. It's wonderful to be able to see a few friends again. But I'm a party girl. I, you know, I used to go out every night. I do massively miss normal life. I think a lot of people seem to think that those of us who are being cautious are kind of pro-lockdown. Hardly. I think everybody hates lockdown. It's causing terrible damage to people's mental health, to lots of people's physical health, and of course to the economy. But I think the calculations that are being made are literally about the NHS. And um, I think that my understanding is that Boris Johnson has seen modelling that shows that within a month, um, if he released on the 21st of June as originally planned, then hospitals would be closed to collapse again because uh, there will be so many people uh, hospitalised. And as we know, there are twice the, the uh, chances of being hospitalised are twice as high uh, with this variant as with the previous variant and a lot of younger people. So I mean, gosh, we just have to hope that by the time, give it another four weeks, uh, with many more people doubly vaccinated, that it will be manageable from the point of view of the NHS and that we can control our borders more effectively so we don't get uh, too many awful new variants coming in. But, you know, clearly nobody knows at the moment and uh, we'll just have to do what the NHS allows us to do. Yeah, yeah, indeed. Uh, let's talk uh, Brexit, Ali, the Observer front page, and uh, Boris Johnson in quite bellicose mood, really, from the G7. Indeed. I mean, we know that uh, marshmallows were being toasted on the fire pits of Tarbis Bay tonight, uh, but unfortunately all is not well. And it's not well because of this whole issue around the Northern Ireland Protocol and the movement of chicken nuggets, sausages and cold meat uh, from uh, Great Britain to Northern Ireland. Uh, and the question is whether they should be frozen or not, uh, according to EU regulations. This is, all comes uh, within the Northern Ireland Protocol. Boris Johnson is uh, being very clear about the fact that he might invoke Article 16, which will allow him to extend this um, grace period at the moment, which would uh, allow these movements to happen. I think three things really are at stake here. One is the internal integrity of the uh, UK, the territorial integrity of the UK. The second is the integrity of the EU single market, which is very important to them. And the third is the sanctity of the Good Friday Agreement, which was always about not having a hard border on the island of Ireland. But the problem is that you've got a situation where a lot of unionists in Northern Ireland, over 50% of people in Northern Ireland, want the Northern Ireland Protocol scrap. Uh, we know that we're now entering the marching season, which is always a little bit of a challenging time anyway. So there may be unrest on the streets. We've already seen unrest a few weeks ago. So this is dangerous. And then we had Emmanuel Macron today, really a red rag to a bull to the prime minister, saying that Northern Ireland was not really part uh, of the UK. When uh, the prime minister said, how would you feel about sausages not being able to be moved from Toulouse to Paris? And Macron saying that, well, that wouldn't happen because um, you know it, it's part of the same country. I and mean, Northern Ireland is part of the UK. And, and certainly Boris Johnson is upset about it. The question is, now what happens? Is there going to be a trade war? Is there going to be retaliation here? We know that Joe well, Biden is extremely worried about this as well. Ali, the, the, the Prime Minister says a trade war highly likely. So uh, it uh, remains to be seen how, how this is uh, concluded. Uh, for the minute, thank you both. Uh, we're going to take a break, but uh, coming up, leave your personal politics at home. The message to more than 100 Oxford University lecturers threatening to boycott classes over a controversial statue. Stay with us.
difficult to tell the truth. This is a forgotten front line. They are dying here. Here it comes. Boy, we've got some interesting ways of showing you what's going on. Their message to us, get ready. Talking like a pocket. Instructing you to stay at home. I can't believe we did that. It's pretty special, isn't it? The wind was, like, pulling us out of that little room. Mandatory evacuation! You must leave! I'm Greg Milam, Sky's US correspondent here in Los Angeles. It is almost impossible to predict where these fires will go next. We aim to be the best and most trusted place for news. This gives you an idea of the strength of those winds, strong enough to bend and twist metal. Are you trying to run me over, Sir Philip? No, go away. Look like it, sir. Will you respond to those who've made accusations, Sir Philip? Can you go away? I've seen the dark side of America. We are standing on the supply line right into the heart of America's opioid crisis. I've seen heartbreaking human stories. There was a river of blood coming out of the mosque. That's a scene that you don't forget. Christchurch has been changed forever by what happened here. Hello, or like we say in my language, the lake. I am Tony Tiu, the founder and the CEO of Renewables in Africa. This picture changed my whole career and my whole life. My mission is simple, is to bring back power to Africa. And our vision is to turn the dark continent that I saw in 2008 into a brighter and prosperous one by 2040. Welcome back. You're watching the press preview with me, our big columnist at The Article, Ali Mirage, and journalist and author Christina Patterson. Welcome back to both of you. Uh, Christina, let's start with you in this section. Um, and have a look at the Sunday Telegraph. Uh, and this is a, a piece about lecturers, particularly at uh, Oxford, keeping politics out of the lectures. Yes, Lord Wharton has written to uh, the academics who are protesting and refusing to lecture because of the Rhodes, the Cecil Rhodes statue still being there at Oriel College, and basically said, keep your own politics out of lectures. And I must say, I think on balance, I'm with him on this one. I Look, the statues thing is complicated. And I think following the Black Lives Matter demonstrations and that, uh, last summer and the movement that's followed from that, I think it's absolutely right that many statues are of men who have been, and they are all men, let's be clear, who have been given a, an elevated position in history in spite of their a past based on the exploitation of, and sale of human beings, I think they should not remain in that elevated position. And I know that the government is very keen to stoke culture wars because they think it will appeal to their new red wall voters who they seem to think are uh, racist. Uh, they're certainly traditional, but I think it's pretty, I think it's pretty insulting to assume that they are racist. And that seems to be one of the assumptions that's made. But on the other hand, I think you can go too far in bringing your own political views into your workplace. There are plenty of things we don't necessarily like about um, our employers, about their histories. And nobody has an entirely pure history. Most companies have been built on exploitation or one for, of one form or another, and so have most historic institutions. So I think probably the academics should concentrate on students who've had a really tough time, who paid a lot of money for, for experiences they haven't had okay. over the past 
Okay. And just get just on want to get just want to get Ali's thoughts on on this. Look, I think it's a it's a difficult one, but I think that there are dangers in judging people uh, by today's standards when they operated in a different time. It is complicated. That's true. I, I much prefer education. People should be educated about the good and bad points of these figures. I'd prefer them to remain. Anthony Gormley, the sculpture, the sculptor said um, Cecil Rhodes statue could have been turned the other way. And I just feel that universities are getting themselves into all sorts of pickles. Today, it's statues. Other, other moments, it's no platforming speakers, which the government is also clamping down on. I just think universities need to get on with teaching students and uh, try and refrain from all this nonsense. OK, Ali and Christina, thank you both.